welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the Frost Art Museum. While our speaker gets mic'd outside, I just want to welcome everybody here today on such a gorgeous day. I'm always excited to know that people don't just want to go to the beach in Miami and uh, will show up to hear our wonderful uh, Green Critics Lecture Series lecturer. Um, I want to thank um, in absentia Stephen and Dorothea Green, who's uh, who endowed this lecture series, which has really put the Frost Art Museum, I think, on the map. Uh, we, when I first got here, which is uh, four years ago, actually five years ago, um, everybody mentioned the Green Lectures, and so I knew I had to keep the momentum going. And uh, we've brought luminaries from all over the world um, to uh, be here in Miami and to um, talk to you about their areas of uh, expertise um, I also want to thank our members because our members allow us to keep our admission free. Uh, we have to, uh, we're thankful to FIU, but we also have to fundraise for all our operating dollars. So I am very grateful to those who um, want to join us and be part of the Frost Art Museum family. So if you can, please join as a member at whatever level you feel comfortable at. And um, I had somebody approach me in the audience today that she has adopted an artwork on our third floor. We have an adopt, adopt an artwork program, which I want to bring to your attention. And I thank people for doing that because the funds go to support our, uh, our permanent collection, which is on view. Um, I invite everybody back here on June 8th when we will open our two summer shows, Cut Abstraction in the United States from the 1970s to the Present as well as uh, Spheres of Meaning, an exhibition of artist books. Now, um, uh, first let me ask you to silence your cell phones, something I always forget to do. And since it occurred to me, I want you to make sure you do that now. I want to introduce our speaker today. Um, and it is with great, great pleasure uh, that Valerie Steele is here today. She is the director and chief curator of the um, museum at, the, at FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology, where she has organized more than 25 exhibitions since 1997, and so many of them um, I try to go see. One is uh, The Corset, uh, Gothic, Dark Glamour, and A Queer History of Fashion. I am sure that many in the audience here have been to this wonderful uh, small museum, which I have to say, when I go to New York, I seek it out. Um, not just because I'm a museum director, but I have found over the years, um, before I knew Valerie, that everything I've ever seen there, I come away feeling enlightened. Like I've learned something, whether it's about corsetry or, you know, or about um, the Toledos or whatever it is, I know I'm going to have a great experience, which is something that I, as a newer director, have taken to heart. How can you, as your university museum, give the public that kind of fulfilling experience? So I really am so happy that Valerie agreed to lecture today. Um, Dr. Steele is the founder and editor-in-chief of Fashion Theory, the Journal of Dress, Body, and Culture, which is the first peer-reviewed scholarly journal in fashion studies, and is the author or editor of, of many, many books. Um, as author, curator, editor, and public intellectual, Valerie Steele has been instrumental in creating the modern field of fashion studies. She's appeared on many television shows, including Oprah, um, and uh, she was described in the Washington Post as one of fashion's brainiest women I don't know how that feels, but you know what? I'll take it. I think that's a, I think, I think that's a good description. Um, and she is uh, listed as one of the people shaping the global fashion industry. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Valerie Steele? Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here. Now I'll need you to bring up my slides and start the first one, and then I'll be able to take it from there. Okay, great. So I'm here to talk to you about Paris, Capital of Fashion, which is um, my new book, but more importantly, also my new show, which will open in September. And Paris certainly has played an important, perhaps a unique role in the history of fashion. But like the city of Paris itself, Paris fashion has also been mythologized. And a myth is not simply true in the manner of a statement like Paris is the capital of France. 
We also have heard that Paris is the capital of art, the capital of modernity, the capital of revolution. Clearly, there's a mystique around Paris itself. And the history of Paris fashion is usually presented as a history of geniuses, or kings or dictators of style who create new looks that the world follows. So, for example, this dress was done in 1987 by the late, great Karl Lagerfeld for the House of Chanel. And incidentally, it was inspired uh, by the idea of Lully performing at Versailles. So it was inspired by his piece, Enchanted Island. So it goes right back and it's referencing to the golden age of the French royal court. So this exhibition is what tries to look at Paris and explore the glamour while also, in a way, pulling the curtain back so you can see some of the realities of why Paris has been so important in fashion. Now, of course, nowadays there's more than one fashion capital in the world. In fact, um, you could probably go around the world going to a fashion show just about every week in the year. And I have gone to a few interesting little ones, you know, in Mexico City and Kiev and St. Petersburg and Copenhagen. And if you go in, they're, they're literally everywhere. Very often they're dueling ones. So you'll have Mumbai versus New Delhi or Beijing versus Shanghai, just the way it used to be Rome versus Florence versus Milan in Italy. The big four, though, are London, Milan, New York, and Paris. But most of the time, people argue, as the New Yorker put it, Paris is still the most glamorous and prestigious of these fashion capitals. So I'll explore a little bit today how that happened and why we believe it to be so. Um, technical difficulties? There. OK, great. One reason is the history of people like Madame de Pompadour. So Paris has played a really important role in fashion's evolving role in the French historical narrative. And actually, when you're going back to the late 17th and 18th centuries, it's a kind of two-headed fashion capital. It's Paris and Versailles, the city and the court. And you have both the very glamorous players, the royals, aristocrats, or in this case, royal mistresses, and then a host of people who are creating the fashions in the city of Paris. So as I work on this exhibition for the fall, one of the things I'm going to create is, a, you, you heard it first here, is a kind of set of platforms inside a shell which is intended to evoke the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. And this is intended to bring up the idea that with Paris fashion, I'm afraid I need that. Thank you. Um, there is a direct line, in a sense, from the splendor of the royal court to the spectacle of the haute couture today. But although there's a direct line, there's also a complicated historical narrative that the French have been telling about themselves and that we've also been telling about them. Because you didn't hear stories about Paris being the capital of fashion in the 17th or 18th centuries, or seldom. Thank you. Um, you would hear occasionally, like a historian of Paris in the 18th century would say, Parisians are the most fashionable people on the face of the earth. Or you'd find in the 18th century a disgruntled Englishman writing, the French are trying to like conquer the world with their language and their fashions. You know, everybody, they're trying, this is a, a power play. They're in charge of everything. Um, but it's only in the middle of the 19th century that you start to hear, oh, Paris has been the capital of fashion ever since the days of Louis XIV. So this, what you hear at that point is a myth in the very progress of, very process of starting to be formed. So that was extremely important important and interesting. Yes, Paris was super important in the 17th and 18th century, but it only really started to be conceptualized slowly as the capital of fashion. I went a couple of summers ago and had assistants who were going through all kinds of databases for the Bibliothèque Nationale, looking for every reference to capital of fashion, capital of fashions, city of fashion, um, cradle of fashion, all of these sort of variants. 
And there were a handful in the 18th century, but it really took off in the second half of the 19th century. Coincidentally, when the haute couture, or it was at first known, the grande couture, was created. And at that point, you start to see the story forming about how it went back in the past. Now, you did have a very, very important fashion system based in Paris, where you had people like Rose Bertin, uh, who was a modiste. Uh, it's not a couturier, it's not a dressmaker. A modiste was in charge of all the decorative effects that you had on your dress, so that you might have new embroideries, new trimmings, etc., that were done every season. And she supposedly is the one who created this dress for Marie Antoinette, although there's a lot of debate about that. It's in the collection of the Royal Ontario Museum and has been loaned to Versailles, um, but it's also been mucked with over time, so there's no straight history of it. And then, of course, you recognize the picture of Marie Antoinette by Vigée Lebrun. One thing you notice right away in looking at these, or later when you look at other pictures of Marie Antoinette, is the distinction between formal attire, the robes a la Française and the court dresses, and then these white chemises with the simple little straw hat that she wears later in the 1780s. And when this painting was shown in the Paris Salon in something like 1787, so just a couple years before the French Revolution, people complained bitterly that the queen had had herself portrayed essentially in her underwear that this was, she was wearing a chemise, like a slip. It was totally unacceptable for the Queen of France to be presented that way. So the picture was yanked. Vigée Lebrun was hastily told to replace it with another portrait of the Queen in a formal court gown surrounded by her children. So she was there as the Queen and the mother of the children of France, rather than in this, her more personal kind of approach to a new style of dress, a more liberating, a more comfortable, intimate style of dress. So that intimate style didn't come, as some people assume, with the revolution or after the revolution. It came at the heart of the fashion system worn by the queen herself prior to the revolution. Now, this would be someone who would be a typical little modiste, the woman who's kneeling below to her client. Because most modistes and most couturiers were working class women who were serving an upper middle class or an aristocratic elite. And they would go to their houses and they'd bring them, for example, here all of the latest ribbons and laces and trimmings. Rose Bertin, the, who became known as Marie Antoinette's minister of fashion. Could I get my purse? Thanks, I'll just take my purse, dear. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a New Yorker, I don't let that purse go out of sight. Uh, <laughs> uh, Rose Bertin was a very different kind of fashion professional. She was the one who boasted of her connections with the queen and who said, oh, this is the style I told the queen she should wear this week. And if you want to wear this, you can. She did have to go to visit Marie Antoinette at Versailles, but everybody else had to go visit her in her shop at the Grand Mogul on the, I think it was the Rue de Richelieu. So, she was already the Karl Lagerfeld of the late 18th century, talking to princesses as though she were their equal, dictating fashions, and being in general a sort of a big powerhouse. Meanwhile, Marie Antoinette was also very much engaged in being a fashion personality. After the revolution, one of her ladies in waiting said, you know, it was really her problem. She really wanted to be the queen of fashion. She wanted to be the most fashionable, the most a la mode woman in Paris. And perhaps this wasn't the right goal for a queen of France. But the, it was very important for her self-identification. If you haven't read Queen of Fashion by Carolyn Weber, I guarantee you it's a wonderful read. It's all about how Marie Antoinette used fashion as a way to try and form a life for herself within the stifling etiquette at Versailles but it was a decision that would later weigh heavily on her reputation. At this time, in the late 17th and 18th centuries, men were as fashionable as women. I did a show last fall called Pink, the history of a punk, pretty, powerful color. And we showed pink men's suits and pink men's banyans from the 18th century, just like pink ladies' dresses. There was nothing feminine or effeminate about pink 
in 18th century France. It was a fashionable, aristocratic, expensive, and elite color, worn by men and women, boys and girls, used for household decorating, used in paintings. It was the color. So how it turned into a feminine color, the short answer is because of the rise of capitalism and democracy, colors, particularly light and bright colors in general, became associated with femininity, just like decoration, lace, floral embroidery, all the things that men had worn happily prior to that. What used to be aristocratic became redefined as feminine. And men, serious men, started to wear serious, sober clothes. But that was a little ways in the future. You start to see it coming in the years leading up to and including the first years of the French Revolution, when more and more men started adopting a, an English style of dress where well-tailored, dark, simple wool suits were seen as being suitable. Now, in France, those were seen as being the mark of the, the commoners. You know, traditionally, aristocratic men had worn color and lace and embroidery. But with the revolution, it became a political statement. If you were for the revolution, you wanted to wear the clothing of the third estate. So even aristocratic men would wear sober-looking clothes. Her clothing is not so sober yet. Her headdress in particular still has a lot of flair. Uh, but her children are wearing already very kind of uh, liberated parents, you know, progressive parents type clothing, not just miniatures of adult clothing. And in this way, people were trying to express their support of the early liberal stages of the revolution, which was supported by a huge percentage of the aristocracy, who really were leading the initial stages of the revolution. Within a few years, however, you get the rise of the radical group, the Jacobins, with their shock troops, the sans-culottes. Again, a fashion reference, sans-culottes, literally, without knee breeches. In other words, working class men who wore trousers rather than knee breeches and silk stockings. Or as Chateaubriand said, you know, the, the men in knee breeches and shoes went out the door and the men with trousers and sabots, the wooden uh, shoes, came in and replaced them. This is actually a, a portrait of an actor. So he's wearing every single thing associated with sans culottes the sabot, the, the trousers, the short jacket. He's not wearing a red liberty cap because that had already become too radical. Instead, he's wearing a tricolor badge on his hat. But all of these things became very, very politicized. And it was at this time that some women who were radical women started wanting to wear bonnet, red bonnets of liberty or tricolor pins. And the government was revolutionary, but they didn't want women getting involved with this cracked down and said, no, uh, politics are really for men, not for women. Uh, and so you're not allowed to wear those things. And that's when they passed a law that said, there's freedom of dress now. There's liberty of dress. No one can tell you that you can't wear something because you're not an aristocrat. From now on, if you want to wear it, you can wear it. But the only exception is men can't wear women's clothes and women cannot wear men's clothes. That was Corbin. So you begin to see this, what had been a class thing, aristocrats, both male and female, being the elite. Now it's men, whether they're middle class or upper class, supported by working class men, are going to be ruling the country, kind of like as brothers instead of under their father king. And women are going to stay at home. So there's a new kind of conception of women, which is very different. Very often people think that this uh, stage of the incredible ones, les incroyables, and les merveilleuses, the marvelous ones. A lot of times people think this is um, aristocratic, and it's not. It's a late stage of revolutionary fashion. After Robespierre had been guillotined, after the Jacobins and the Saint-Culottes had been put down, and it's a more right-wing but still revolutionary Republican government. And fashion comes back into town. You no longer have to dress down and hide your money. And the men start wearing these very uh, elaborate, outrageous new styles. It's actually, you see, the, it's kind of a knee breeches, but in some cases, it's a long, tight pantaloon. Um, women start wearing an exaggerated form of that, those dresses that you saw Marie Antoinette wearing, uh, an exaggerated slip dress, much sheerer, et cetera. 
and the hairstyles are new and different. There's big scarves. It's, it's a very aggressively new style. And in some respects, in retrospect, it almost looks like a punk style. But at the time, this was seen as the revival of fashion, but new fashion, no longer a court fashion. Um, this, even this fashion was copied around the world. This, when I first worked on my first book, Paris Fashion, I bought these two prints in Paris. This was from the year nine in the revolutionary calendar. And this is from, I guess, a few months later in 1800 or 1801. This is the French original. This is the English copy. And as the, as the French dealer said to me, la poudre anglaise, look at the prudish English. They've brought her, her décolletage right up, because in the French version, you can see her nipples. Um, and instead, <laughs> instead, you can see the naked caryatids on the little table. You transpose the nipples down to the table. <laughs> so the style is copied, but it's modified. This is something we'll see again. Um, after the revolution, royals came back. Um, you have a transition where instead of the old style aristocratic court life, you have the development of what's really been called la vie élégante, you know, the elegant life in the city of Paris, where upper middle class and middle class people tried to imitate elements of aristocratic elegance and style, not so much the style of the clothing, but a manner of being elegant and being sort of casual about it. And you have very elaborate, pretty new styles coming in. Notice the waist is dropped, the skirt and sleeves are filling out. And the men's outfit is in a transitional stage. Uh, this is 1830, and it's still got the high uh, neckcloth and the big collar that were associated with the merveilleuse. Oh, sorry, with the uh, incroyable. But this look of a kind of elegant fashionability became very much a part of Parisians' self-identification. They really increasingly thought of themselves as being the fashionable people. And you start to see writers talking more and more about Paris being the place where all the fashions are the best. And then you also have the tremendous production, as you'd had for a while, of press images of fashion. In the 18th century, they sent around little fashion dolls, which were dressed in miniature versions of the latest fashion. And those were sent around the world. And in my show, there's going to be one very beautiful one that was sent to England, a court dress. In the 19th century, it was switched to magazines with illustrated fashion illustrations. This was done by, this particular one was um, drawn by one of a group of sisters who were all fashion illustrators, the Collin sisters. Their father was a painter, their brother was a painter, but they did, you know, sort of historical scenes, and their brother did one of Salome with a naked woman lying on a throne. But they were tracked into things like book illustration and fashion illustration. So here, notice, one of them does this quite beautiful little fashion plate showing a little fashion doll, a little bit of archaizing style. This is from Godey's Ladies' Book in America, a year later. And so you see the central figures put in, but with other figures as well. This was typical of the way fashion news was spread. And the American writers for Godey's and other magazines said, well, yes, the French start these fashions, but we make them Americanized, more sensible, more appropriate, etc." But there was a big debate, debate that went on in America about whether it was good or bad that so many American women were copying Paris. And this continued right through the 19th century into the early 21st century, sorry, early 20th century. So uh, one of my favorite quotes, they said, how can the daughters of Puritan ancestors wear clothes created for the wicked women of Paris? You know, they, they should blush for shame. You know, these are things that, that are immoral clothes, that immoral people wear. And yet, despite this, there was a great feeling on the part of the aspirational that they wanted the glamour, the fashionability, the beauty, the novelty of Paris fashion. So there was a tension there. Sometimes you'd find it uh, with 
Bostonians, for example, they go to Paris, they buy all the latest couture, and then they keep it in a trunk for years. So it wasn't too painfully new when they brought it out. People had gotten used to seeing pictures of it. Worth is the big name here, of course. Charles Frederick Worth, the uh, English by birth, went over to Paris, went into business with Beaubourg, was, I believe, Swedish. They started a, a couture house together. Now, couture just means sewing. And um, it's at this point, though, that Worth starts to transform couture from being a small-scale artisanal craft into being big business and with pretensions of being high art. I mean, he wore a beret like Rembrandt, and um, he would sometimes really sort of present himself as an artist. So he was quoted in the press as saying, I am an artist just as much as Delacroix. You know, my colors are as beautiful. I have ins great inspiration for how I'm going to create new dresses, etc." And he was instrumental in founding the first organization, which was an organization not just of couturiers, but also of people who made confection. In other words, ready-to-wear clothing. So at that point, the two of them were lumped together, the manufacturers of clothing. And to say that he was a grand couturier, which people did, just meant that he had a big house for sewing. And he was one of the first to show, to think of it in terms of collections. Uh, so they'd have certain tops and certain skirts, which you could mix and match, but he'd present them. This would be the styles they'd have. There, was also, there were also moyen couture, petit couture, but it was just a question of how big the house was. He would have hundreds of workers working for him, some of them doing tailoring, some of them doing dressmaking and more fluid styles. Over time, though, grand couture, big couture, was changed to haute couture, high couture, with the idea that it wasn't just a question of a bigger business, it was a question of high art that it was truly luxurious and elegant, and it epitomized perfect Parisian taste. So you get a whole new idea that's coming in about the significance of couture. And this is one of his dresses from the 1860s. Um, so this couture starts to be seen differently. And there's a lot of pushback with Worth, because most couturiers, couturiers were women. It was unusual to have a man who was making clothing. And Dickens, for example, wrote an article where he told presumably scandalized readers in, back in England that there were in, in Paris there were men, real men with hairy fingers who dressed and undressed the highest ladies in the land, you know, made them parade back and forth in their clothes. It's like, whoo, whoo, this is like scandal in the couture house. Plus, um, Worth was really interested in people who would, were able to pay a lot of money. One of the reasons he loved American clients, he said, was because they had the faces, the figures, and the francs. They were willing to pay. And a lot of them um, would come over. One American woman came over with her family, her husband's family, and her poor father-in-law was paying for her to get dozens and dozens and dozens of gowns at worth. And they went out together to the imperial court of Napoleon III. And, to go on a, a visit for a week, they would bring dozens of different changes of outfit. And she was not an, I mean, she was important financially for Worth, but she was not a princess. And so as she describes that, she said, well, he told me he thought a lot about my dress, but you know, it, it didn't seem worth it in terms of the amount of money. It wasn't that he was doing something special for her. He would just kind of say, kind of, I see you in yellow. Here's your yellow dress. But still, you have him promoting himself as that kind of aesthetic genius, that he would have to have the great idea, and then you'd have to follow along. Most of, there were, had been many, many respected smaller female couturiers before, like Madame Palmyra and Madame Vignon, but they've been completely forgotten now. Worth was the one whose impact at the time and then later with historians has been so extreme that he kind of stands towering above them, partly due to the novelty of his having been a man. And for that reason, he attracted a lot of artists, sorry, a lot of writers would use him in their novels or write articles about him. When he died, it was international news, you know, the great worth had died. But it's important 
to remember that at the same time that couture was becoming more important, so also was ready to wear. This was also the period when department stores like the Bon Marche appeared, where you could go in and buy ready to wear clothes at set prices in a kind of women's world. These were like indoor malls that with women, they could go to them and spend all day there. They could eat there. They could drop the baby off at a nursery. They could read in a library. They could spend, and it was a safe, genteel environment. The only problem might be that you might be so tempted by all the things out on the tables that you'd be tempted into kleptomania, which was seen as the new middle-class women's disease. Um, tempted by everything out on display. Because in the old-fashioned stores, you'd have to say, can I see that pair of gloves? And, you know, in that French way, he'd very unwillingly show it to you. <laughs> and he'd put it back. And, you know, no, bar no sales, no bargaining on price. But now everything was out on the counter. So people were tempted. Uh, and it's over the course of the 19th century that Paris becomes indelibly associated with La Parisienne and the whole idea of feminine fashion. And so a la Parisienne, this was the ideal for everyone. Writers would talk about how, you know, they are Parisiennes and they are provincials. You know, the Parisienne was more feminine than women anywhere else in the world. But they also said that any woman could become a Parisienne if she would come to Paris and really put her mind to, like, learning about fashion, that you could learn this as well. And the idea of the, the skills and taste of the Parisienne applied not only to the consumer, but also to the maker. So the idea of milliners in particular were seen as the artists of fashion. And indeed, you know, Worth was one of the first couturiers to put his label in his dresses. But the milliners had been putting labels in their hats even before that, because they were seen as being artists. And Degas clearly regarded them as artists. And he's created them, pictures of them as fellow makers of creative, beautiful things. And that was a very common perception of them in the 19th century, that they were really admired for their skills and their sensibility, their taste. Here you see um, workers coming out of the couture house of the house of Paquin. And Paquin, next to Worth, was the biggest couture house of the late 19th, early 20th century in Paris. Each of them had hundreds of workers. And when there was a strike, there was a song, the Revolutionary March of the Little Dressmakers, which had lines like, what does the little dressmaker demand of the house of worth or of Paquin? More money, less work. And here you see a, an American, Mary Cassatt's sister, at one of those scenes of fashionable rendezvous, the spaces and places where knowledgeable fashion spectators and observers would watch each other and learn what fashions were, the opera, the theater, you notice there you know, people are looking at each other, their mirrors reflecting, all of this idea of, of fashion being a participatory sport. And it was full of experts. Then you have a growing knowledge on the part of knowledgeable consumers as well as creators of the whole history of French fashion. And you draw inspiration from that. This is a, from a wonderful book about fashion in Paris showing two Parisian ladies looking through old fashion plates to get ideas for the kind of fashion they would want to have. Because they were still working with the smaller couturiers to help create their own fashion. And the department stores had industrial designers who were creating fashions for the department stores. So, and there were fashion magazines presenting all these. So there were many sources of fashion um, and many ways to see fashion. Department store windows and shop windows became super important, as did the big world's fairs, which always showed fashion, particularly when they occurred in Paris. And again, you start to find an, an emphasis on the 18th century lady as being the kind of ideal who would inspire modern fashionistas to have this elegance from the past. In the 20th century, styles changed dramatically. But notice how in this fashion plate for Paul Poiret, the high-waisted dresses are explicitly being compared to the older silhouette. By the 1920s, designers from like Chanel and Lanvin, these are actually Lanvin, um, are creating very modern styles, which were still really appealing. 
and a lot of the discourse of Parisianism was still there. But these are much simpler dresses, and they're much easier to create ready-to-wear copies and do knockoffs. So after the First World War weakened France terribly, and then the Great Depression kicked in, got stronger and stronger. People in Paris started to get more and more agitated that ready-to-wear clothes from England, from America, from Germany were taking up more and more of consumers' attention rather than Paris fashion. So the struggle to maintain Paris in the face of competition really starts to grow. This is a wonderful cape by Scaparelli from the 1930s showing a, a pa, the Apollo um, with the horses at Versailles. So it's again evoking the golden age of the French royal court, but right in the middle of the depression in France, and in fact right before the fall of France, the Nazi occupation of Paris, and what nearly turned into the complete and permanent collapse of Paris fashion. Meanwhile, you have in America, a still this, Paris wasn't created just by the Parisians, because you can make up propaganda, as every advertiser knows, and people won't necessarily believe it unless they want to. But Americans, like the movie makers who created films on Marie Antoinette, and this is a costume in our collection that was from the film Marie Antoinette, an MGM film. Um, this, the Americans were very complicit in idealizing Paris, and manufacturers in America were making money by idealizing Paris and copying it, and consumers were seeing themselves as being more elite and more chic if they wore, as someone said in, in the song from the Broadway show, a copy of a copy of a copy of Dior. You know, that somehow you could have a little bit of that glamour. And indeed, after the war, although American designers had been functioning on their own during the years of the Nazi occupation of Paris, Almost immediately after the war, the French surge back into popularity. And explicitly, they make the connection with the glorious past. So you find fashion photographers photographing Dior ball gowns in front of the gates of Versailles, which notice have not been gilded yet. If you go back now, they look very different, much more rich. In other settings, is a constant sense that the beauty of Paris fashion, and particularly Paris couture, is seen as part of the patrimony of France and something which is special and different from fashion anywhere else. And you see this increasingly as you go into the 80s when there are more and more images of fashion being photographed at Versailles and more and more discussion of the importance of, par of fashion and Paris as being central to the French economy, the fr French self-image. And this is eagerly picked up on around the world. In the 80s, hard to believe now when nobody wears fashion, but in the 80s, fashion was really fashionable. There were lots of new designers, both fret a porte ready-to-wear designers like Jean-Paul Gaultier, and couture designers like Christian Lacroix started. Karl Lagerfeld came to Chanel. In the 80s was a really fashionable period, and the French made the most of it. Even those, the, uh, the incredible styles, those sort of late revolutionary styles, start to be picked up by designers like John Galliana, one of the most historicizing of designers. English again, but working many, for many years in Paris. This is a for a woman's outfit, though, based on a man's revolutionary fashion. And then uh, a merveilleuse style outfit, again from a Galliano collection. So there's a kind of romance that's built up in the memory of images now, not just of the, the sweetness of life before the revolution, but even kind of images of punk violence and disorder during the revolution. I was mentioning like this kind of elaborate hairstyles with, you know, even full ships to celebrate naval victories was very much a part of old regime fashion. And this was picked up by designers like Jean-Paul Gaultier. And I actually called up uh, Gaultier's press person and asked if I could borrow this for my show. And they said, oh, Andrew Bolton's already requested that for camp, for his show. So, but I think I will be able to get this dress from Gaultier instead, which has the great panniers like an 18th century dress. And again, Galliano, 
not everybody is historicizing like this, but if you go online on YouTube, you can see how very many fashion um, videos with modern fashions are, sh are shot at Versailles or in the courtyards of the Louvre to emphasize the connection between the glamour and prestige of Paris fashion and this long history. My, one of my very favorite Galeanos for Dior is this one from 2000, which I put on the cover of my older book, Paris Fashion, because here we've got the, the bloody mark of the guillotine across her neck, um, which, get, and in fact, on the dress, on one side of it was her in her little kind of I am a milkmaid at Trianon outfit, and on the other side it's an image of the guillotine. So again, he's playing with the whole the mythology of queen of fashion ends up being killed because her love of fashion and the sense has alienated so many people. It's an image of woman, not as queen, but almost as royal mistress and spendthrift. As her own mother said, this, when she sent her a portrait, you don't look like, this is not the portrait of the Queen of France. This looks like an actress. So it's like a fashion model mistress rather than a queen. Men's wear as well has been recapitulated, but almost always in women's fashion. This is from Louis Vuitton last year. Because when it comes to men's fashion, first London and then Italy, and then the United States sportswear have taken over the men's fashion field. And in the last few years, copying Milan, Paris has made a really big effort to appropriate that for menswear in Paris. So that Virgil Abloh at menswear for Louis Vuitton, um, or the menswear designer for Dior, having a senior moment, British designer, quite brilliant, um, are creating looks which combine tailoring with sportswear. I'll just show you a couple more pictures so you'll see how the image of Paris has been purchased willingly by people all over the world. This kind of romantic image, who didn't want to go to Paris in the 1950s? If you could imagine yourself, a big part of fashion is imagining yourself wearing those clothes in that place. And this kind of image is a Jacques Faure. Many of these designers went and had licensed copies, so they worked with American manufacturers to make licensed copies of Dior, licensed copies of Jacques Faure. And in this way, the manufacturer was really able to have Paris fashion work for them. They made a lot of money by copying Paris fashion. And it was much easier than trying to push the idea of an American fashion on a consumer market that didn't necessarily want it. Here you can see again how the new look itself becomes picked up decades later and reviewed over and over. This is from when Galliano was at Dior, but now Maria, uh, Maria Grazia Chiori, the woman designer at Dior, is still every single collection has things which evoke the new look of 1947. It's part of this kind of heritage. So one reason why Paris is still the capital is because of the reputation. And another related to it is because of Dior, which is part of LVMH, which is a gigantic conglomerate which owns luxury companies, and Caring, uh, which also has, owns luxury companies, are both based in Paris. So here you find direct licensing. This is from the 60s from our museum. The one in front is a Chanel haute couture suit. The one in back is a line for line licensed copy by Orbach's department store, which is like the equivalent of Macy's. And when they were sold, they were both put in the windows of Orbach's with signs saying that the couture original was whatever, $450, and the copy was $29.95. And this made a lot of money both for the copyists and for a long time for the couture houses until the market started to switch and it was no longer regarded as desirable or profitable to do the copies that way. Long story short, now in a world of fast fashion, you find designers from all over the world showing in Paris, ideally working for French houses, like this was a Phoebe Philo from Celine, and then they're disseminated around the world by fast fashion houses like Zara, which knock them off. So in this way, Paris styles, no matter where the designer's from, 
keep spreading and trickling throughout the world. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions if you have them. In fact, I will feel that I'm a failure if there are no questions. My feelings will really be hurt. There's a question. That gentleman has a question. Yes, and the Parisians hated it. Uh, the, they, the Italians broke through in a couple stages. The first attempts didn't really work. In the 50s, they came up out of Florence, and the Americans went to Florence to buy. And it wasn't Chateau Margaux. It was Chianti. It was cheap and chic. But the Italian principessas were really nice to them and weren't snobby like the French. And you could buy great clothes for much less money. So there's a big Italian wave. Americans were really into that. Again, in the 70s, when Milan triumphs, you get real clothes for real people, rich people. Rich people can wear expensive American-style sportswear made in Milan, but still appealing. At this point, Yves Saint Laurent's husband later, Pierre Berger, said to a journalist from Time magazine, what have the Italians ever invented except spaghetti? And the journalist said, well, actually, Pierre, now that you mentioned it's an easy kind of luxury. It's not fussy and stiff. It's very easy and comfortable luxury. And then what really killed the French is in the 1990s, Italy was really so successful. So many French fashion clothes were even made in Italy. And the, the French press was filled with complaints about how they're being ripped off by these Italian vampires who were making all of the money up from French genius. But in fact, you had lots of great designers coming out of mostly Milan then. And that was a very successful period when the stylists from Milan were making a lot of uh, successful designs. Yes, over there. What role do the metiers d'art have in keeping France? The metiers d'art. Uh, the artisanal craft workshops play a very important role, although many of them have died out um, because there are only a very few companies that really will use them enough to keep the companies in business. But Chanel, for example, has bought certain ones that do embroidery, for example, or do feather work or do ribbon making. Um, and then periodically, a number of the big companies, particularly Hermes and LVMH, will bring out the craftspeople, women as well as men, and show them doing their work in public to emphasize that it's not just mass-produced stuff in a factory with very badly paid labor, but something which has a lot of skill and people who are getting paid a living wage to do it. But it's still something which is a very small percentage of what's actually produced. But I think it's crucially important. And it's one thing that... America has almost none of anymore. We've lost whatever craftspeople we had. Um, there are craftspeople elsewhere, for example, in India and in Africa, but only a few companies have worked regularly with the same groups of craftspeople to enable them to, to flourish as workers uh, and have a true partnership. Because if you fly in and just try and exploit them for a season, it's not going to work out for either of you. Um, whereas the French have this sort of history of having them there uh, with a multinational workforce in why, France. Why has America lost its craftspeople? Because the American fashion industry was always geared towards mass production, and you don't have craftspeople for that. <laughs> yeah. First of all, Barry, I'd like to say how much I enjoyed hearing you speak. Oh, thank and, you. Um, listening to how fashion's evolved over the centuries. But when I think back, I feel one of the most important players in the haute couture world and in fashion is Chanel. Yes. Because if you think she created all these wonderful designs in the 20s, 30s, and then after the war, and we're still talking about her today, and I think she's very special, and I'd like to hear your views on Absolutely. her. Absolutely. In the exhibition, we're going to be having several important Chanel pieces uh, because she was probably the most influential designer of the 20th century, um, the one that really everyone copied. Um,
because she was not only a brilliant designer, but also her own best fashion model. So she kind of had the image as well. But in the exhibition, we're having a little black dress, her classic thing. We're having an incredibly elaborate, embroidered little black dress. And we're having an amazing red feather cape. In addition, we're having that red suit that I showed from Karl Lagerfeld, the red and gold one, uh, and another black dress that Lagerfeld did in homage to Chanel. It's a long black dress, and it's encrusted with trompe l'oeil jewelry, necklaces and bracelets, and then picking up on her idea of her mixing real and costume jewelry, but in this case, putting it on the dress. Uh, I think she's very, very important, and there's a section of the show where I'm going to talk about the cult of the designer and how certain designers have, to us, epitomized what Paris fashion is. It's a, a, a path from Chanel to Dior to Saint Laurent. I mean, we really see some of them as being these really great geniuses. And we've also forgotten some who were great geniuses who weren't able to keep the company alive. So we'll also show some people like Augusta Bernard or Madeleine Viennet really brilliant designers, but the, and Gray, of course, but Gray is remembered a bit more because uh, she lasted for a while longer. Um, yeah, we're having them in the show as well because what they did was so unbelievably important and gorgeous, even though most of the kids at FIT won't know who they are. The show will open September 7th, uh, and it will go till January 4th. Yes, someone back there. I see someone. Yes. Copying was never OK unless you bought the rights to do it. A licensed copy made money for both the couture house and the manufacturer in America or in Germany or in England. Um, and department stores had it too, like Bonwit Teller and Henry Bendel would have licensed copies in their little couture salon. Um, unlicensed copies are things that look very much suspiciously like that season's Foth or Dior, but you didn't pay anything. And, and you, when you paid, you paid not only to get the toile, the pattern for it all, but also you paid to get the buttons, the material, etc. It wasn't hand sewed. And if you, if you actually could handle those two Chanel suits, the one from Orbox is inferior. It's made much less well. Um, but to look at them, they look pretty damn similar, much more than a Zara copy does to something today. Yes? This is a vision of so much bias to our men. <laughs> In 1970, we used to wear those very colorful polyester. <laughs> <laughs> did that ever get to Paris? <laughs> oh, it did. It did. It absolutely did get to Paris. And during the late 60s and 70s, see, Paris never had a youth culture the way America and England did. So a lot of things had to be copied from those countries and, or reinterpreted you know, in terms of you know, futurism. So a designer like uh, Pierre Cardin, who's a brilliant designer, was trying to bring in modern-looking menswear as well as women's wear. But with less than an hour to speak to you, my show, my book, focus overwhelmingly on women's fashion. Uh, we use men's fashion almost as a counterpoint. Like, they lost out to London. They lost out to Milan. They lost out to uh, New York, uh, and particularly to Harlem and Brooklyn. Um, but for women's wear, they were able to maintain the reputation and prestige. So another show would have to be looking at some of the menswear successes and failures in Paris menswear. A lot of failures. <laughs> yeah? Oh, interesting question. Uh, fashion business practices. Hmm. Not off the top of my head. Um, 
there were a lot of eccentric characters, of course, in fashion, but the practices have remained remarkably consistent. I mean, even the very idea of seasonal collections, for example, which is so built into fashion. You have fall, spring, summer, you have fall, winter. Although now you have drops every three weeks because people yeah. don't want to wait any longer. But that spring, fall thing, that existed in 17th century Paris and Versailles. That's when the magazines of Mercure de France would start saying, and now for the new season in court, this is what we see all of the ladies wearing and the gentlemen wearing, because there was equal attention to that. So some of these things that are really part of our fashion world have tremendously long French roots. So that's an interesting, odd fact. I wasn't quite cognizant of that before. And there was one back there. Thank you. I'm curious if, uh, in your estimation, the appointment of many non-French as chief designers in fashion houses in France has it diminished the role of the French um, on its, the world stage in terms of fashion, or has it elevated it? Uh, I don't think it's diminished or elevated it. I think it's, it has been from the beginning a component of Paris fashion. Worth was British, Scaparelli was Italian, Maine Bochet was American. Um, there was a show at the Museum of Immigration in Paris which showed how very many foreign designers there have always been at uh, Paris houses. And that's not surprising. Um, for a while, I think the French were a little stressed because there were so many English and American designers that it seemed like, you know, the Anglo-Saxons, as they say, were taking over completely. Um, but partly that was because the English had better fashion design schools, like Central St. Martin's and London College of Fashion, and the Americans had better training in marketing and fashion business. And the French really lagged. Now, just within the last two years, the um, Institut Francais de la Mode, which kind of did business studies, has gotten together with the school of the Chambre Syndicale to try and teach both more avant-garde fashion design and up-to-date business things. So even though you weren't getting necessarily all the designers there, what's really interesting, though, is you kept the power of the big luxury fashion houses in Paris. Because after the war, they lost art, they lost finance earlier, but they kept on with women's fashion. In fact, they built, the Americans have failed utterly to build a luxury conglomerate. I mean, just recently, Michael Kors bought Versace and started Capri Holdings. And there's another one, Tapestry Holdings. But if you haven't heard of these, don't kick yourself, because it's not exactly LVMH. These are just very beginning attempts Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah.